And for more on Shop Shopify, Apple, as well as the markets, we're now joined by Diana Avigdor, Portfolio Manager and Head of Trading at Barometer Capital Management. Diana, good to see you. Thank you, Catherine. Nice to see you. Let me first get your take, uh, and we should bring up the stock, Shopify, for, for our viewers to see. The market doesn't necessarily love the deal as a first reaction, setting it down 6%. What do you think? You know, uh, you look at the chart and you see how it's gone up since first quarter of 2019. It's up so much. Some people, and I understandably so, I understand that some don't like the valuation. This is a hugely growing company, um, so certainly valuations do get to be extended. Um, there is also this matter of little matter of rotation in the market late, that you mentioned uh, in the beginning of the top of the hour. Yeah. And uh, the service, um, uh, the software as service companies, all of them um, as a sector have been very much uh, in demand and, and they're getting hurt on that as well. So I believe that Shopify would not perhaps be down this much mm -hmm. um, if it wasn't for the fact that we're still seeing some rotation out of the loved um, uh, growthy companies and some bottom uh, fishing and, and some of the value um, mm -hmm. that we've seen yesterday particularly tend to a lesser extent uh, today but still going on. Um, you know, the price tag is not that large, um, but uh, people are scratching their heads a little bit as to, you know, it doesn't provide any revenue uh, or much of a revenue uh, for 2020. Uh, 2019, it will only see cost. Um, but, you know, you mentioned Apple and, and Shopify, and I just want to say something about both of them. Two companies um, that are investing into their future potential growth. Apple and Shopify, two different companies. Yeah at two different levels of their maturity cycle, for sure. But for example, you know, with Apple, um, the iPhone has been less than half of its revenue um, last quarter, and that's the first time that happened uh, since 2012. So the app, the phone itself, <clears throat> the hardware is not what needs to drive Apple's future revenue. So it's investing in content and, you know, and the phone, uh, not the phone, the, the watch that, that is linked to um, a health app, <clears throat> which is right. the next big thing. Uh, that has huge implications for, for growth. So um, um, companies that are moving away from um, where they need to be to continue growing and, and innovating themselves. So mm -hmm. um, I think they're, they're both looking okay. With, with Apple, for example, we have, we have the China trade spat holding it back a little bit. But, um, but Shopify, you know, it's investing in its fulfillment, um, customer service, it has a million customers since its inception. It has huge growth. So people are worried that it may be paid a little bit into it, but that's normal. Mm -hmm. Two steps forward, one step back. It's just back into its moving average. What do you think, though, about the narrative, the commentary that uh, that Shopify is looking to compete with Amazon? I mean, just to say that makes would make <coughs> people a little bit more nervous because yeah. we, we know what Amazon has done to other industries much larger than a Shopify as an example. Do you think that that's even the right way to be thinking about it? I understand that uh, people are comparing to Amazon because it's fulfillment and, 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 and the same type of thing. It's very dangerous to say to compete with Amazon because people get fearful to your point that, mm -hmm. you know, you can't compete with Amazon. But I think that um, Shopify so far has been able to prove its innovation and uh, maybe we uh, we watch for how this develops, but it really isn't that much uh, in their cost. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's not going to impact the financials that much at this point. Um, so there's no need to worry about it's impacting its profitability or, 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 or its path to growth for now. And Diana, as head of trading for Barometer, meaning you're on the institutional side for our viewers to understand, um, what, what kind of chatter do you hear around Shopify in terms of how desirable it is to own it in, in your portfolio as a long-term hold? Yeah, well, you know, um, Shopify in the last six months has really opened itself up to shareholders that are outside of Canada. I think that Canada is challenged, uh, Canadian stock market is challenged sometimes when it's only perceived as a commodity play. Um, and we are dependent for capital flows in our stock market because we're a small market capitalization relative to the world and we are dependent in foreign flows and, and we want those foreign flows. And when we come up with companies that are this innovative and growthy, that's fantastic for Canada. So what we've been seeing and we've been hearing from mm -hmm. other traders on desk is that there's been interest from uh, the global community. Mm -hmm. And this is what you've seen in that chart yeah. um, halfway through. It's that interest from the global community and all the software uh, for service companies, both because they're all pretty small cap. So 
So if you're a large portfolio manager, some of the large U.S. companies <coughs> excuse me, cannot achieve scale in their portfolios, like a 3% position, and you buy the whole company. So you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So you need to buy little slices of different companies to get say, a 5% weight in the software service company. So Shifting focus a little that. bit here. Yeah. We, we're talking about this momentum shift that we're seeing out of these crowded growth names and, and into some of the cyclicals and, and value-oriented plays. Um, do you think that's just a near-term momentum kind of shift, or will this be sustainable? I feel like we've seen this, this picture 10 times over the past five years. I hear you. The market seems to move uh, from a binary uh, right-hand side to left-hand side, so we're either talking growth, global growth, and you know, and let's buy all the growthy companies, small cap, um, um, high valuation companies, or we're going into a recession and we're selling everything that's cyclical. Mm -hmm. the, the world is actually a, a bit of a water table. And um, you're right, and, and there's a lot of money moving into one type of thing all the time, so it balances out. And right now, I think it's just a balancing function. I think it will be okay. I think some of it is triggered by the sell-off in the bond market, which has been really the bubble out there. Um, what do you and, mean by that? I yeah. mean, obviously, yeah. there's been a huge momentum into fixed income for uh, years, yeah. decades. But certainly, even over the past six months, people have been moving way back into fixed income products. Absolutely. Um, uh, so so uh, I'll try to explain. There are products out there that, and we talk about this sometimes, whose mandate is to keep a particular asset allocation a particular volatility parameter. So these accounts uh, tend to have an X amount of their portfolio in bonds and an X amount of, uh, of their portfolio in equities. And some of these allocations are triggered by mathematical formulas, which some of the inputs are volatility, for example. Mm -hmm. So as volatility in the bond market is perceived to be lower, more money can be put in, those, uh, in that asset class. But the volatility in the bond market has really spiked up in the last three months, which means that from a quantitative perspective, the math spits out that now the volatility in the sector that you were in is too high. Right. You need to bring it in. So what that means is you cover all your shorts, you sell your growth, you just become smaller in your portfolio as these guys do use leverage to gain exposure. So when you, when you sell your bonds that you've had long, you also cover some of your shorts and sell some of your growth names. And this is why the market has become a bit of a water table. Do you think that there is do you think that there is a, a bond market bubble coming? Do you think you have to uh, there is a question before that. Do you think that yields are going to zero in the US? Because if you think that, then it's not a bubble. Right. It's gonna continue. Uh, do you think that we're going into a, a negative rate world? for many, many years to come. Is that the new normal? In that case, it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I think with everything, you have to find the balance. I don't think that there's ever going to be a situation where you say, I don't need any bonds ever, or I don't need any equities ever. Mm -hmm. You do always have to use your judgment as to what stocks and what sectors you gotta be in, what part of the curve in the bond market, you want to be in short, uh, long. But I mean, the volatility in the bond market, um, it's pretty high. We've gone from negative two, two and a half on the 210 year inverted to a plus four and a half in a week. Right. That's that's very volatile, so you gotta be careful. Just last question here. Um, you have been more focused, I believe, uh, in looking at gold positions. Uh, yeah. Have you increased? the size of your gold positions in no. the portfolios? No. We decreased a little oh. bit. Yes. So last time we spoke about a month ago, we spoke about gold and, and, and the positive uh, momentum in gold. And well, while we still think is there, and as long as the negative yield narrative is out there, as long as there's $17 trillion in negative yielding bonds, as long as U.S. Treasuries continue going down in yield and making gold a store of value, um, that is more attractive relative, um, gold will work. But okay. it is very overextended, and it has very overextended. And the bond market moderated, because not it can't, doesn't go up all in the same uh, mm -hmm. line, all in the uh, same, uh, all at once. So we've taken some profits on about a third of our position. Okay. Dana, and we, we have look to, to get back in. Yeah. yeah. All right, Dana, we have to leave it there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. That's uh, Diana Avigdor, Portfolio Manager and Head of Trading at Barometer Capital Management.